Well, Sierra sisters and brothers and brothers and sisters, we come now at this time and in this way to think upon our Creator. Think upon Jesus, how He gave of Himself that we may live. And to learn a bit, a little bit more about uh, teachings of uh, these things that we do in our Indian religious tradition and walk in this Native American Christian path. And so today we're going to look at the spirit of the buffalo and how that, uh, how that medicine sings within the, uh, within the Bible. And so our readings for today, we're going to have a, we're going to have a couple of them here. Well, our reading for today, if anybody wants to open their Bible uh, to Genesis uh, 16, 1 through 4, we're going to start there and then uh, we're going to go from there. So Genesis 16, 1 through 4 is our opener today. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, born him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord, or God, has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And now we move on to uh, Genesis 21, and at this point, uh, the story, I mean, it would take quite a while to read all this, but let's go to Genesis 21, and uh, in that period, uh, Hagar had a son named uh, Emmanuel, and he, or, you know, Ishmael, and he grew up. And by, during that time also, Sarai was con had conceived a son, and Isaac, I believe, and uh, and she had a son at that time. So now there's two sons, one's of an Egyptian woman, and one is of uh, Abram or Abraham's uh, first wife, Sarai, and her name was later changed to Sarah by God as we'll see here in this room. So we're looking at 21, Genesis chapter 21, verses 9 through 21. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So Ishmael and Isaac were brothers, half-brothers, and they were hanging out with each other, having a good old time. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son. For the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. And for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. And she sat opposite to him. She lifted up her voice and wept. 
and God heard the voice of the bull. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid. For God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. And God opened her eyes and saw a well of water. She went and filled his skin with water and gave the boy the drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the boat. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Now, that was our reading from the Hebrew Bible, and today we're now also we're going to go to the New Testament, to the book of Luke. And let's jump on up over there. Here we go. And we're going to take two readings out of the book of Luke also. The first reading is Luke 1.38. And it's just one verse by itself. And it says, and this is Luke 1, 38. Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. And now for the, the bigger reading here, we're going to jump over to Luke chapter 19, verses 24 through 27. Now, in this context, at the beginning, in that initial verse, the context is the angel coming to Mary telling her about she's going to conceive uh, the Messiah. And here is at the end of his journey. He's on the cross, and he's in the process of dying. So we're looking at chapter 19, 24 through 27. So they said to one another, and he's talking about the soldiers, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near to the cross of Jesus beside were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary, the disciple, whom he loved, standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Okay. So we are looking at buffalo medicine, and to understand what buffalo medicine is and how it relates to these two women, uh, we need to have an exploration of buffalo medicine in the Indian religious tradition. Now, buffalo, the, the interpretation varies from nation to nation, so I can only speak for myself in this way, but, you know, uh, most of the Plains nations associate buffalo with the north in the four directions. And even in the Cherokee tradition, you know, back east, there was a different kind of buffalo from the Plains Buffalo, which was the forest buffalo, which is what our people hunted a lot back in the day. Uh, they're not around anymore. They, they've gone extinct now. So, uh, but Plains Buffalo are thriving, which is good. Uh, but buffalo medicine, in the understanding of this way, is about purity of mind, body, and spirit. That's the medicine of the North. The buffalo is the medicine of those who give it themselves that others may live. And of course, many people look at the North Way as being the place of the, the older ones, you know, uh, getting ready to transition over. Also, keep, keepers of the wisdom. And so, uh, when we think about buffalo medicine, we think about how people give of themselves that others may live. And what does that mean? Because, you know, there are many, many ways to uh, give of yourself. For example, uh, supporting community, you know, helping your neighbor out in the time of trouble, 
Uh, also, maybe uh, uh, supporting a food bank or uh, making donations of clothing to thrift store. All of these things are important. All of these things help improve the quality of life of other people. When uh, giving of yourself carries the connotation of being a nurturing and supportive person who is concerned about the welfare and the well-being of others and not just yourself. One who is willing to hear as the, the song of our Creator, to hear as, as Creator sings within us, and to have the faith and the trust to follow that teaching, to take that journey. It takes courage, a lot of courage, to be willing to give of yourself in that way. And or in this context, we think about these two women in the Hebrew Bible and how they have done this. Now, of course, in our Indian religious tradition, we have ceremonies in which, for example, the Asi ceremony, the sweat lodge ceremony, where the people go into the lodge for purification, but also to suffer for the people. They spend many hours in the UC going through a difficult challenge to pray on behalf of those who are in need, who suffer from physical illness, mental anguish, emotional turmoil. And they pray hard for them as they suffer in their, and they, uh, they give of themselves that way. So also to do the sun dances. They spend a week four days dancing 24 hours, you know, to do that vigil. Dancing and suffering to help their families, to help their community, to help their people. So there are many different ways to do these things. Some are more intense than others. And when we think about Hagar, here is a young girl, a young Egyptian girl, who has been taken in as a slave. And basically that means she has no rights. She is owned by her master. She does what she's told. No choice. So she's helping out these, these foreign people in a foreign land. She's got no family, no support system of her own. She's by herself. Doesn't get paid. Doesn't have anything if it's not given to her. And the day comes after a devoted service to the people there that she's, uh, she's owned by, the day comes when her, her owner, the woman she's been taking care of all these years, walks in and says, okay, now you're gonna be a wife of my husband and you're gonna bear children for us and not for yourself. I have no idea what kind of uh, situation or circumstance today that would fly in. I mean, I don't know any women who would be willing to do that. But she did. But you don't see anything in here about her protesting, about her trying to run away. We don't see anything in here about her being uh, argumentative, objectionable, crying out to God, say, oh, don't give me this burden. She does it. And in so doing, God is with her. She supported Abraham in his need for an heir because back then, ownership of property, assets was the only way to guarantee that your family line was going to continue on. And so she does support this. She has a child, a son, Ishmael. And then, uh, lo and behold, the time comes when Sarah, Sarah has a baby, a young boy, Isaac, who we know is the, the father of the, of the, of the uh, Jewish people, the Hebrew people. And, uh, and something happens that we would never even probably consider, and that is Sarah demands that this slave girl, this Egyptian woman and her son, be thrown out into the wilderness. Now we get a hint that Abraham struggled with this a little bit. But she does it. Takes a little bread, takes a little water, and she leaves. Now we don't have the full story about what happened, but 
Put yourself in her shoes. <coughs> Think about how would you feel, where would you be at? Here you are, having a good time, your son's growing up together with, her, with, her, with his half-brother, and suddenly one day you're told you got to hit the road into the wilderness. you got nothing. No food, no way to survive, not even water to drink. And you wander off voluntarily into the wilderness, knowing that you're going to die. Would you be willing to do that? But she did it. She just walked off. And we hear in the in the readings today that the uh, the biggest challenge that she had was not wanting to watch her son die. So she sets him under a bush so he'll have shade, and she goes far enough away that she doesn't have to watch him die. And she sits and she cries. And we get a hint from the reading that the boy was praying too. He was probably crying and wailing and praying also. Because he didn't want to die. And so the angel comes and says, hey, God heard the boy. The boy cried out to God and God heard him. And God had already promised Abraham that this boy was going to be a nation. He was going to be the father of a nation. And that's a pretty big deal. And so we come to that place where the boy uh, is rescued and we know who he is the father of, what nation? He's the father of the nation of the Arabs, the Egyptian Arabs, the whole people. That's where the Arabs come from. And that's why they're related to the Jews and of course why they have this ongoing conflict between the two of them all this length of time because they both trace their lineage back to Abraham. And so, uh, and they feel like they've been slighted. And that's a long time ago. And so contemporary stuff, that's, they know more about than I do. And that's what we're looking at here. We look at how Hagar reflects the medicine of the buffalo. For Hagar, she didn't put herself first. You know, we rely upon the buffalo. The people have relied upon the buffalo here in North America for thousands and thousands of years as a food source, a source for shelter, the skins, the hides were used to make teepees, clothing, the buffalo robes were used to keep people warm, the sinew from the buffalo was used to make moccasins, to make drums, to sew all these things together. The buffalo has, if it weren't for the buffalo, the peoples of North America would not probably have thrived or survived. So God putting the buffalo onto the poor planet here in North America has been a great benefit to the people. And that is why we admire and we respect those who walk with buffalo medicine, who are willing to be of service to the people without hesitation, without reservation, or expectation. And so we think about that. We think about how Hagar walked that trail. When she was told that she needed to marry Abraham and bear him sons, she did it without hesitation, without her own personal sake in mind. We do hear that after she bore a son, she got a little full of herself, not too much in that past. And then we also heard where she voluntarily just, when it came time, she walked away to allow another son to inherit the entire ownership of the properties along the Abraham with nothing for her son except death. And so we see here how she walked that way. And because of that, God blessed her. God blessed her son. Took care of them, made a nation of them. That's the power of that medicine when it is brought out in that good way. And we see likewise in the in the New Testament. You know, here's another young girl called upon by God to bury, bury the Messiah. 
with no understanding whatsoever what that meant. She didn't know what was going to happen. She didn't really understand what it meant to be the mother of the Messiah. And yet, we learn in this story about how she was there for him. She did it willingly. She, she suffered and endured the, the trials and tribulations that came with that. She continued to set that good example for others to follow. She didn't try to talk him out of it. She didn't become an obstacle in his path. Instead, she stood with him the whole time. His family was right there with him the whole time. Well, most of them, his sons and brothers, that's another story. But his mom right there with him the whole time, all the way to the cross. And we see here that she suffered and endured, watching her son, her firstborn son, be persecuted and murdered on the cross. And she suffered for the people that way. She gave of herself as a mother that way. And so we admire these women for what they have done. They have shown what it means to be pure in spirit, to put the needs of the people as equal to or greater to their own needs, to set that good example for others to follow so that the community as a whole would have a good quality of life and not just themselves. And that's very important. In our Indian religious tradition, our Native American Christian journey, we are a part of community. We live in the spirit of Gaduji, the spirit of community. We help each other out. We watch out for one another. We treat each other with dignity and respect. And we give of ourselves that others may live. And so you think about that. Think about what that means for you. Do you know people in your life? Who reflect that spiritual teaching as Hagar and Miriam reflect that they are willing to do to help others even if it makes them suffer a little bit you know today in North America there are a lot of children a lot of people who are hungry who go without and there are many who call themselves the good people who sit, sit on the hands or sit on their seats and allow these things to continue because they have this belief they're morally superior and therefore whoever is suffering deserves it. And so we think about how is that walking the buffalo mess? How is that walking the heart of our Creator? How does that reflect the teachings that you saw? We think about all these things and we wonder and we ask, are we doing this too? Are we ignoring the suffering of the people? Or are we helping to be a service? Are we living that buffalo medicine? Do we have that willingness to walk as our Creator makes our hearts sing to walk? And so, only you can decide that for yourself. And I call upon you to think about how these women are but two, only two of the many examples in the Bible and in our lives of those who live according to the buffalo medicine. And ask yourself if you're willing to live that buffalo medicine yourself. Or can you?